Welcome to this second case study for best practices for phenotypic drug discovery. This is brought to you by the EFMC Best Practices in Medicinal Chemistry Working Group. And today we're going to look at how a team of researchers used phenotypic screening to identify new druggable targets in an important pathway called the WIND pathway. This case study was kindly provided by Matthias Fredriksen from the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. Now, as for other case studies, we will not cover the whole scientific story here, but rather focus on key aspects to illustrate the concepts which we have developed in the WEN webinar. Of course, we encourage you to look at the whole scientific discovery story which has been published. So let's first look at what the WIND pathway is and why it was interesting to target. The wind beta catenin pathway regulates stem cell pluripotency and cell fate decision during development. A key element of this pathway is the stability of the transcription factor beta catenin, which is in blue on this cartoon. This is tightly regulated. In the absence of wind activation, you see that on the left, cytosolic beta catenin is constitutively phosphorylated and targeted for degradation. On the other hand, upon wind stimulation, the beta catenin destruction complex dissociates, as shown on the right, leading to the accumulation of nuclear beta catenin and transcription of wind pathway responsive genes. Now, the reason why the team was interested in this pathway is that deregulated wind pathway activity has been implicated in many cancers like breast cancer, lymphomas, liver cancer, colon cancer, etc., making it an interesting target for anti cancer therapies. Now, one of the challenges, however, is that there is only a limited number of pathway components that are amenable to small molecule inhibition. So, the idea was to use phenotypic screening to discover new targets for therapeutic intervention and potentially also new chemical starting points. So how did they do that? The concept of the screening assay is shown on this slide. It's designed to monitor WIN3A induced WIN pathway activation by measuring beta catenin mediated transcriptional activation using a luciferase reporter assay called SuperTop Flash in HEC293 cells. So the idea is that the pathway inhibitor will lead to increased beta catenin degradation, decreased gene expression, and therefore decreased luciferase activity. So this is the assay concept. Now, importantly, in order to exclude compounds that would stimulate other pathways or interfere with the luciferase readout, the team used three different counter screens with the same luciferase readout and in the same cell line. The idea is that by using different stimuli and different reporters, the counter screens measure beta catenin independent transcriptional activation, namely CRE, NF kappa B, and TGF beta. Therefore, the compounds which would be active in any of these assays would not be specific with beta catenin inhibitors and should be excluded. And as we've seen in the webinar, the use of these appropriate counter screens is essential to select hits that are of interest. So let's look at the results now. One of the compounds that were identified is shown on the upper left here. It's called XAV939. We'll also refer to it as the active compound or A. You see that it's a potent inhibitor, 16 nanomolar of the STF reporter assay. However, it doesn't show any activity in the other reporters, CRE, NF kappa B, and TGF beta. Now, very important also, the team identified a closed structural analog shown on the right, which had no activity on the WIN3A induced STF reporter. And we highlighted this in the main webinar, and you will see that during the rest of the presentation. Having an active inactive pair is critical when it comes to identifying the MOA of a compound in particular. Now, the team went a little bit further and they looked at another cell line um, to study the effects of the compound. We can consider this as an orthogonal assay as we looked at in the WEN webinar. So what this slide tells us is that the compound also inhibits ST activity in SW480 cells. These are 
wind mutant colon cancer cells that have constitutive activation of the wind pathway. So they don't need an external stimulus. You see here again that XAV939, the active compound, concentration dependently inhibited the reporter activity, while the inactive control shown on the right had no effect. So this is further proof of the action of the compound on the pathway, and importantly, in a disease-relevant cell line. Now the team looked a little bit more carefully at the effect of the compound on the pathway, and in particular, they studied the effect on pathway components. What you see on the right side of this slide is that XAV939, the active compound, but not the inactive control, leads to decreased levels of beta-catenin that's consistent with pathway blockade. In addition, the compound increases the levels of axin, which is a key pathway component. So now that we have established that the compound inhibits the pathway, the team wanted to look at functional effects of inhibiting this pathway. And they looked at cellular growth of cancer cells, namely either APC deficient colorectal cancers, cancer cells using either beta-catenin DLD1 cells, these are on the left, but also as a control, beta-catenin independent RKO cells, which normally should not be responsive to pathway blockade. So what you see on the left is that XAV939, but not the inactive control, significantly inhibited colony formation of DLD1 cells. And importantly, this you see on the right, XAV939 did not affect colony formation of the control RKO cells. So now we have a pretty strong package for this compound. We know it inhibits the pathway in different cells. We also know it has a functional effect on inhibition of cancer cell growth. The question was, how does it actually work? What is the mode of action of this compound? Now to study this, the team decided to first make chemical biology tools. And the first step was to develop ACR to find a linkable derivative. That is, a position on the compound that tolerates a linker to attach labels. And what you see here on the upper right is that they identify this linkable derivative, which contains this amide group instead of the CF3 group. This obviously can be further derivatized and has similar activity in the super top flash assay. Out of this derivative, they prepared first a affinity matrix immobilized compound that can be used for pull downs. We'll see, you in a, see that in a minute. And at the bottom, you see that they also made a sci-fi label fluorescent compound, which can be used for other purposes. And we'll see that in a couple of slides. So let's start with the immobilized compound, which they use for chemoproteomics experiment. You see here the chemoproteomic workflow. The idea here is that we can incubate the immobilized compound together with cell lysates containing proteins. The proteins that bind to this compound will then be retained when we do a washout. We will wash off all the unbound proteins, and at the end what we get is the compound immobilized together with the bound proteins. These proteins we can analyze by limited proteolysis and quantitative mass spectrometry to try to identify these bound targets. So the results of this experiment looks like this. Importantly, these experiments are run in competition mode between the immobilized analog and either XAV939 or the negative control. The idea is that proteins that specifically bind to XAV939 should be competed by this compound, but not by the inactive control. Again, showing the importance of having this pair of compounds. So this is what you see on this graph. On the x-axis, you have the competition with the inactive control. And on the y-axis, you have the competition with the active compound. The interesting proteins, those which are specifically competing 
with the active compound are shown in the blue box because they only compete with it and they do not compete with the inactive control. Now the team analyzed roughly 700 proteins and out of those, 16 were significantly and specifically competed off with soluble XAV939. Now very interestingly, four of them are in the same family called the PARPs or poly-ADP ribosylating enzymes. These are PARP1, PARP2, tankeris one and tankeris 2 Very interestingly, these are also druggable targets. So now we have identified these proteins, but importantly, as we've seen in the main webinar, these chemoproteomics experiments generate hypotheses that need to be confirmed with additional experiments. So this is what we will look at in the next few slides. So the first thing the team did was to establish the affinity of binding to the identified PARP proteins. For this, they performed a compound competition experiment by immunoblot, which is shown on the upper left graph. And what the data shows is that the active compound XAV139, but again, not the inactive control, blocks tankerase binding around 100 nanomolar and blocks PARP1 and 2 binding around 1 micromolar. They further characterized the compound binding using the sci-fi label fluorescent analog, which I talked about a couple of slides ago, and shown that it bound to the catalytic PARP domain of tankerase 1 and tankerase 2 with KDs around 100 nanomolar and with a slightly lower affinity to PARP1. So they confirmed binding. Now they wanted to look, of course, at functional activity. And first, they looked in a biochemical assay whether the active compound could inhibit the enzymatic activity of tankerase 1 and 2. What you see in this table on the upper right is that indeed A inhibits tankerase 1 and 2 enzymatic activity and with a slightly lower potency also the activity of PARP1 and PARP2. So this is biochemical data. Finally, they looked at enzymatic activity in cells. This is shown on the lower right. And you see that, again, A inhibits parcellation of axine, and hence the enzyme activity of these, of these enzymes. So now we have a pretty strong package suggesting that A, XAV939, is at least a tankers 1 and 2 inhibitor. Now, importantly, XAV939 has been further characterized as it was submitted as a chemical probe and was shown to inhibit uh, the whole PARP family. You have more details if you click on the link on the lower left of this slide. OK, so now we have a target hypothesis. We sh we've shown that the compound inhibits tankerase 1 and tankerase 2. The key question now is whether these targets are responsible for the functional activity of the compound on the wind pathway. To study this, the team used complementary genetic approaches. We've seen this in the main webinar. This is a very useful and often essential step to validate the mode of action. So what you see on this slide, in particular on the left side, are siRNA knockdown experiments. So we knock down different genes. And what you see is that siRNA knockdown of individual tankerases, tankerase 1 or 2, does not modulate the pathway. We essentially have no effect on beta-catenin or on axin levels. However, when we knock out both tankerase 1 and 2, we have a strong effect on the, on the pathway. We have decreased beta-catenin levels and increased axin levels. And essentially, this dual knockdown phenocopies, so has the same effect as XAV939, this is shown on the right, which suggests that dual inhibition of tankerase 1 and 2 by XAV939 is what is driving pathway inhibition. So this is the end of this case study. What you've seen here is that a phenotypic screen using the appropriate counter screens, as well as orthogonal assays, led to the successful identification of a validated hit. Chemistry was critical to identify a negative control, but also to develop 
chemical biology tools to perform chemoproteomics experiments to identify the mode of action. The results from these experiments were complemented by genetic validation to identify the MOA, and the authors postulate that the MOA is dual inhibition of tankerase 1 and 2, which is needed for inhibition of wind pathway. Obviously, more studies would be needed to develop this into a therapeutic strategy. With this, we hope that you've enjoyed this case study and we thank you for your attention.